I'm Ramsey Nasser. I'm a computer scientist. Uh, and my primary interest is in programming language design and uh, code as a medium of self-expression, is how I've been calling it, um, perspective. So I design programming languages that either encourage people to be creative in, in programming and coding um, and explore really what it means to actually express yourself in code. Uh, but I also build languages that sort of reflect on the current state of programming and, um, and computer science and, and sort of ask questions that I feel aren't being asked about code. And it's important that they function. I'm not interested in design fiction uh, or just hypothetical design. Um, it's very important for me that the languages I make be Turing complete, uh, which means that they are real programming languages. They're not faked or simulated in any way. Um, because that forces me to make artistic and aesthetic decisions that I wouldn't have had to make if I were just, you know, creating a sketch uh, or some kind of some kind of hypothetical piece. Um, but it's, um, his his vision of the future is is a, a world where um, where computers and machines and technology are open to everybody in the most in the most fundamental way. There are no computers today that can be really meaningfully reprogrammed by anybody that uses them. Uh, and it, it, it's band-aids over band-aids over band-aids and bad decisions over bad decisions over bad decisions and never a moment to kind of reflect and reinvent. So a lot of the technology that we use today that your iPad is running on was developed in the late 60s. And this isn't like ideas that developed, came out of the late 60s, like literal technology that came out of the late 60s, almost unchanged. Um, and that's because, you know, to reinvent everything would mean that, you know, you'd have to re rewrite the last, you know, 50 years of software engineering. Um, they tr um, I've always found code to be the medium in which I can express myself best in a lot of ways. Um, it's, it's the lens that I see the world in. And uh, while at iBeam, I really started to ask why, like why that is, like what, what is special about code to me and to others, right? Writing code is specifying behavior, right? So if you want to put it on a spectrum of uh, existing art forms, it's a behavioral or it's an instructive art form, like writing a musical score or writing a screenplay, right? It's not painting. It's not like writing a novel. It's providing a set of instructions. What sets it apart is that um, it's the first instructional uh, medium code where the instructions are not interpreted by human beings necessarily. They're interpreted by machines, whether it's the Jacquard loom, whether it's you know, your Arduino or your MacBook. Um, that's what makes it unique. And what's unique about the fact that a human being does not need to interpret your code means that your instructions, which is your art, which is your ideas, can live and run independently of human intervention. That's never happened. It won't change. And I always feel like when I develop like a, a video games, um, whenever someone is playing one of my video games, that's a little piece of my imagination that's just springing to life and just running, you know? Um, um, or, you know, code that I have running in the cloud on servers. That's just, those are ideas, those are things that kept me up at night, wondering, thinking, structures that I would assemble, you know, to solve problems that are just living not on you know, text on page, but actually moving and manipulating memory and moving data around independently of me. Um, um, and if I were to die, my running code would carry on little bits of me, I feel, you know, after my death. So, that, so that's what it means, I think, conceptually to me to, like, to express yourself through code, is to be able to build a set of instructions to specify a behavior that can live and run independently of any, any human being. But also, how about a way? Code, one of the effects that code has on your imagination and your thinking is a, sort of a filter of ambiguity. You'll, you'll come to code with this sort of vague idea of what you want to do, but then when you want to instruct a machine on how to do it, you have to basically squeeze almost all the ambiguity out of it and specify exactly what it is that has to happen. And that's where a lot of people struggle, I feel, with... with uh, I mean, a computer can do four billion calculations a second at, at this point. And what that means is that you can write code that specifies a loop, for example, that'll run a hundred million times doing different things on each iteration, right? 
And as a programmer, you can look at those three lines of code and see 100 million iterations into the future and understand what that means in a single glance. And that, as a, Edgar Dijkstra, the seminal computer scientist, in his Turing acceptance lecture, said that programming has allowed human beings to think thoughts previously unthinkable. And, and that's the kind of thought that I think he was referring to, is being able to see into this, you know, impossibly deep iteration and really profoundly understand what, what it's doing in aggregate and, you know, at each iteration. Hmm. And I feel like there's a lot of attention put on, like, using code to make things that are poetic, which is, you know, a lot of Zach Lieberman's work and Golan Levin's work does that. And it's, you know, uh, their stuff is poetry, right? It's beautiful. It's using code to do things that no other medium could do. Um, but the poetics of code that I'm personally more interested in are the poetics of, you know, the actual instructions that go into these pieces, the, um, the, the, the programming, right, of, of these pieces and the languages that they're written in. Um, and that can be poetic and beautiful. Uh, and I find myself, there's a, you can tell something about the person who wrote the code, the state of mind that they were in, whether they were in a rush, whether they were frustrated with the project by reading their code and not even running it, you know? So there's a, um, the performance is one thing, but there's a beauty to the score itself, right? That if you understand how to read that music on its own, is it's absolutely beautiful. Hmm. So that is, uh, Conway's Game of Life is one of my favorite algorithms and one of the most profound experiences I've ever had learning an algorithm was Conway's Game of Life. Uh, and there's an incredible implementation of Conway's Game of Life in a programming language called APL, which is uh, a programming language based on symbols, not on text. It's expressed in a single line of code. This is a non-trivial, fairly large algorithm uh, that simulates uh, an infinitely changing world and they were able to bring it down to a single line of just APL. And that is, there's a beauty to that. You know, you just look at it and everything is there. It'll take you hours to read and to parse and understand exactly what's happening, but it's all there. Uh, but I definitely, uh, even the term readable is a, is a problematic term, you know, readable to who. Uh, and so in terms of naming variables or like what do the actual programming languages look like, um, they're all, you know, written in American English. Um, so to create basically what, what's called a, a class in some programming languages, you type the letters C L A S S, right? Um, to name your variables, you know, if, if you're naming the speed of a player, for example, if you're making a video game, you'd call it player speed, P L A Y E R. Uh, and this is all, you know, makes sense to the point that, uh, Apple tried to develop the most readable programming language they could in the early nineties called AppleScript which was designed to be, to mimic written uh, English. Um, the language itself is unusable. But the fact that their idea of the most readable language possible was written English is telling. Um, and, and reflects on the fact that all modern programming is done in a single written, you know, it's tied to a single written culture, which is American English, not even British English. Um, and the piece that I did most recently that reflected on that is a piece called Elb. Um, which is a Lisp-like programming language programmed entirely in Arabic. Uh, and it's meant as a reflection on just that, like what, what are the ties between human culture and computer science? Um, and it was partially an engineering performance art piece that, uh, you know, where I tried to explore, like, how difficult is it to build something, a programming language, not in English? Um, and of course, everything broke, right? The terminal breaks, the, I had to build my own text editor because no text editor supports Arabic. Um, I, the language till today uses Ara English file names because loading in Arabic URLs was just inconsistent. Um, and that, the basic answer to my question, like how dependent are we on American English is we're entirely dependent. Every tool that exists expects programming to be in American English all frame American English, all frameworks that you would interact with for graphics, for sound, expect all the function names are in American English. You know, it's a single, it's tied to a single written culture. And I'm interested in what this means to learn code um, if you're Chinese, if you're Indian, if you grew up not even with a different language, but with different alphabets, because the Latin alphabet is not the dominant alphabet on earth. Uh, uh, 
And when you look at all the hype that there is around teaching computer science and programming to everyone, to teaching it you know, to everyone in the world, does this mean that we have to teach everyone English first? And that, that both. There's certainly, there's an imperialism to expecting people to learn English uh, to write code. You know, there just is. The reactions to my Arabic language were very telling. Um, a lot of people would just say, well, English isn't that hard to learn. You know, like, learn it. Um, and the counter challenge to that is, well, you know, Arabic isn't that hard to learn either. Learn my language. Um, this really, it's very difficult to do this stuff as it is, right? To learn how Unix works and to learn C and to learn all of these like 60s and 70s era technologies that we now depend on. And I feel like there's a tendency to, to learn that and then just sit on it and, 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 and just feel that I made it this far. I now understand these things. I can manipulate the world in this way and stop and not reflect on like, well, how can I open this up to everybody else? Is this everybody else? Is this actually the right way to be doing things, right? Is Unix the best way to organize a, you know, computer? It's not, spoiler alert. Um, is, is you, you get people who become sort of enamored with the traditions and the, the paths that, that, they've, that they've taken to get to where they are and expect everybody else to just learn the way that they did, right? Um, that's, that's where I find myself sort of not in dialogue with software engineering as I've experienced it. There's much Arab, Arab, traditional Arab art is, uh, fascinates me because in a lot of ways I feel like that it's a triumph of the human creative spirit. Um, so under the Islamic empires, it was generally taboo. Representational drawing was generally made taboo and, and earlier sort of Arab art, uh, you will find representational paintings and, and mosaic work, um, but that drops off very quickly. Uh, and the, the reaction to that wasn't a death of creative expression at all. It just moved somewhere else. And instead of painting people, it became calligraphy and it became geometry. So the sort of where math finds its place in Arab culture is these incredibly ornate geometric designs that decorate the in, in, insides of and outsides of buildings. Um, and when you read about how they were made, they were assembled by generally you know, skilled craftsmen, but they were designed by artists as algorithms. So the instructions to the craftsmen would be place, these black, place this black tile, then a red tile to the side, and then turn it around, place a black tile here, and then like, you know, a long tile there, and it's just instructions, right? Again, instructive art form. Um, and obviously the, Arab, the Islamic and Arab empires had you know, major contributions to math and science that we still, we still benefit from today. Like you said, algorithm comes from al khawarizmi it's an Arabic, Arabic word. Um, sort of, you can get into these really profound philosophical conversations with computer scientists about you know, what is computation? Does nature compute? You know, um, the, um, the fact that the inside of a, of a shell is, can, you know, come out to be the, a, the perfect golden ratio or the golden rectangle, the, you know, the spiral comes out perfectly, like that is a form of computation, arguably. Um, the, the orbits of the planets are a form of computation, you know, so depending on how far out into the deep end you want to get, you know, everything can be computation. Um, I think, again, looking at computation as just as an instructive art form, I think a lot of what um, a lot of the work that Fluxus did in the '60s with their, um, you know, disassemble a flute, reassemble a flute uh, pieces um, is definitely a kind of computerless computation. I feel computerless code, um, and I felt, uh, you know, screenplays uh, are also a form of, of computation without computers. Uh, you know, before all this stuff. Uh, what is it? A computer is a machine that can interpret and execute instructions independently of human intervention. That intervention, but like a contract, is is you know a set of rules that you have to that you have to live by, right? Law is a set of rules that you have to live by. If you do this, then this happens. When you do this, then that happens, right? And that, that society is almost computing those rules, you know, by the way that we interact. Like, why don't I throw trash on the street? When you look at traffic, why aren't cars driving all over the place? Like, people stay within painted lanes like that.
there's obviously an, you know an element of safety and self-preservation, but people follow rules, right? Um, and you end up with this sort of social machine of people interacting and like moving in and out, uh, and and that's that's certainly a form of computation. You know, com computation doesn't need computers at all. Computers are just um, computers were originally built to do math, right? Before computers as we know them, what a computer was was a human being who was really good at math that would get fed, you know, do this, and they would do it out by hand, and you know, they'd provide the results. Um, and I feel computers. Uh, computation exists. Computation is the the execution and the interpretation of rules, uh, and computers are just one way to do that. Yeah, we are... well, even when you look at DNA, I mean, it's literally a it's a base for code. Like it's a computer is just a base to binary code, right? DNA is just base for. It's literally just information and instructions encoded in proteins that is then executed, and you know, allows us to have this conversation. You know. Um, a lot of modern, so Alan Kay didn't study computer science because computer science wasn't a thing in the, when he was in college. He studied math and biology. So he has a, you know, his background is I think in molecular bio biology. And he modeled object oriented programming and small talk around cellular communication. And his problem is that things were meant to fit together like gears, right? So this component has very specific expectations about this other component, and they fit together in a very specific way. And if anything changes, the entire machine breaks. This is the world that we still live in. Alan Kay's vision, which is a biological vision, is you have these independent units that are just exchanging messages, right? And if one unit goes down, then, I mean, the system doesn't go down. Things can adapt and things can move. This is how the internet is built. That's why the internet is, the internet is built. That's why the internet is as robust and as resilient as, as it is, because it makes no assumptions about the things that are around it, and it's just exchanging these messages and kind of reacting to change that way. Uh, so it's very much the computation found in biology that's inspiring the what I think are the most successful software artifacts that we have today. Future proof. I mean, we think about the internet. Uh, this is a system that was designed in the late 60s um, that could not have at all have predicted the way it's being used today, right? And it has continued to run unmodified and without serious, this is, it's an example of technology from the late 60s that is not, you know, being band-aided over and over. It just, it works, right? It's built as a stack, right? We build on, on the, upper, the upper levels uh, in the application layer uh, to follow that model, um, but it, it functions. And that's because it made no assumptions about how it would be used or what it would be used for. So we were able to add Wi-Fi to technology that was built before, you know, um, before the laptop, before the personal computer. It's, it's mind-blowing. The fact that it's mind-blowing. The fact that your, your iPhone seamlessly integrates with this ancient technology, you know, no, no real problems, is, is astounding. And that's because it works on this sort of biological model. So that's, that's I mean, my personal perspective, is the kind of distributed message passing paradigm is the right way to build things. And that's, in a lot of my work, is sort of what I'm exploring and what I'm interested in. So we, yeah, we are in many ways surrendering our, our lives to algorithms. Um, the most obvious example is, you know, the financial sector that, um, that allows algorithms to make trading decisions on a, you know, sub-second level. Um, decisions that the people who are running them do not understand. This is the key point that's alarming, right? is um, you can't understand a machine or an algorithm that is running that fast, that is making that, you know, making decisions based on that vast quantity of information. This isn't like the three-line for loop that I described, where you can just kind of look at it and, and understand it. It's doing its own thing at this point. And we've given our economy to this math that we only have a tangential understanding of. And that's alarming. Um, alarming. Um, we also, you know, via dating sites, we have algorithms decide who we court and who we sleep with. I mean, and as, as passionate as I am about algorithms of computation, I mean, I find that alarming and problematic. That's not, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a humanity that we need to retain. You know, I don't, you know, I don't, my ideal vision of the future is not one where we've surrendered everything to algorithms, right? Um, it's one where we develop a healthy relationship with, with computation and code. 
um, in a way that can make our lives, you know, better, but not one where we blindly surrender everything to code, which code that is obfuscated, proprietary, and run by corporations. I mean, program her iPhone. I mean, you can't, you can't truly own something until you can re repurpose it that way. Um, so surrendering ourselves to algorithms uh, without fully understanding them is problematic. Surrendering ourselves to algorithms that are owned and manipulated by corporations with particular, uh, you know, interests in, in their, on their bottom line is, is alarming. And I, Google frustrates me. Um, and Google has fallen very far, I think, from its, um, from where it was a decade ago. Um, I think Google Glass is technically interesting, maybe, but um, to me it represents uh, an encroachment of the algorithm on, on human relationships and human interactions and not a healthy enhancement of it. Um, yeah, I disagree with Google's vision of, of the future. Um, Google's Google's operating policy is to collect data about people and sell it. I mean, that's just that's not a that's not an that's not an accusation. That's just their business model, right? Um, model, right? Um, I don't. I my idea my ideal view of the future is not one where software is controlled by corporations. My ideal view of the future is where software is flat and accessible to all and mani manipulatable by all. And the, the devices that we use are not locked down and are not obfuscated and are hackable by default um, and, and um, repurposable by default, right? Nothing Google is building is like that. Nothing Apple is building is like that. Nothing that they're planning on, and more importantly, nothing that is in their interest to build is like that. That, that kind of a future is not gonna come from a startup from a corporation, it's going to come from, um, you know, hackers and activists, people building tools for other people to use. Um, so, um, even like emoji on the iPhone, right? People are very excited that they, they can now express themselves um, through, like, pictographically through these more refined um, emoticons, and it's cool. But the question that I ask is, how do I make my own emoji? I can't. The vocabulary that I can use to describe is restricted by whatever Apple thought was important, right? And that's where I find, um, and one of the earliest moments that I had that kind of frustration was when I was a child playing with Legos. And I loved my Legos, right? Again, a story any creative person will tell you, not special. But um, the earlier sets of Legos that I played with came almost exclusively with bricks. And they, the bricks represented this set of established rules. Few pegs, they fit together, different sizes. They're all, you know, the peg is the unit. Is it like two by one? Is it, you know, you know five by five? Um, and you just get all these different colored bricks. And you look at the instructions. And if you assemble those bricks in a particular way, you get this castle. And that's, that was incredible to me. I felt, I felt on parity with the Lego company. Because like when I build stuff, I'm just using bricks, right? And when they're building stuff, they're just using bricks too. So it's flat. I can do anything they can do. Do anything they can do. Down the line, Lego sets got more and more complex, more and more complicated. And I remember this one piece. I bought the submarine set. And I don't know why this one piece like this just lives with me. Um, and it was the propeller piece for the submarine. And part of it was just the standard two by two Lego brick. And then molded onto it was this really fancy propeller with a fan. And I remember looking at that piece and seeing the propeller part and thinking, I could not have done that. There is no amount, this is outside of the rules of Lego. And it's a cool piece. And now I can have a propeller and it's a propeller, but I'm no longer on parity with the Lego company. They clearly have injection molding machines, right? That I don't have. And that's just like, I can't, create my own emoji. There are things on I many things on iOS Apple can do that I cannot do. And the same on my laptop and the same on every piece of technology. So that's a question that technology. So that's a question that I always ask is like, what can I make 
What can I have done? What could I have done? And what can the author or the creators of the system do? And am I on parity with them or not? And I try and build systems where everybody, makers, users, and everybody is on, is on the same level. And that's kind of my vision of a technological future, is that kind of, of flat relationship. Uh, and it's not where we are, and it's not where we're headed, unfortunately. So Minecraft is, uh, is sort of the logical um, world building Lego uh, project. Um, Minecraft is, is a fascinating study in language design in, in an abstract sense, uh, because the trick to language design and the trick to the kind of flat, um, the, the trick to the kind of flat relationship that I really envision is if I'm making a tool and I'm making a system, I'm obviously making some set of primitives that people are going to manipulate, right? The challenge is, what is the minimal set of primitives that I can create that will allow people and myself to express you know, the widest variety of ideas? Um, um, Minecraft walked that line very, very well, I feel. The world in Minecraft you know, is it's built according to a set of rules. There are a small number of different pieces, and the rules with which you create them are fairly consistent, and that's what the world is built out of. There are programming, I mean, wizardry is when you say a particular set of cryptic phrases, something happens. And when you write code, you say a particular set of cryptic phrases, and something. it's literally the same thing, right? Um, yeah, so, so in, in that sense, you know, coding is, is magic. Um, um, so it's very much on my mind, is like, who is the audience? How can this be communicated to you know, people who are non-technical? Um, and it's actually kind of why I got into video game development, which is outside of this, because now it's a thing like, oh, people get games. Like, oh, I made a game, you know? Like, it's not a weird object model that no one cares about. Um, but I, I was taken back to hieroglyphics and, and pictographs uh, and petroglyphs. And uh, I really started thinking about sort of a pic just a pictographic representation of ideas as code. Um, and emoji is sort of this like modern, almost hieroglyphics, and this modern pictographic language. Uh, so it's very much, you know, a contemporary vocabulary, but the ideas that are going into the project are, you know, trying to, I'm trying to bring them back from, you know, human evolution and the evolution of written language. That's one of the most profound, certainly the most profound a computer science experience I've ever had. And one of the most profound life experiences I've ever had was learning how that algorithm worked. Um, Conway's Game of Life uh, is what, what's called a zero player game. And the way it works is it divides the universe into a grid, of, a two dimensional grid of cells that are either filled or not filled. And as a player, you create an initial configuration of cells that are filled and not filled. And the algorithm then runs over that the entire universe of, of cells and implements a set of very simple rules. If an unfilled cell is, has three filled cells around it, it becomes filled. If a filled cell has more than three filled cells around it, it becomes unfilled. Things like that, there's you know, three, three rules like that. From Initial, given an initial configuration and those simple rules, the kind of profound complexity that you can derive is, is, uh, is mind-blowing. When Conway was like, doing it out by hand, he didn't know if infinite with behavior was possible. He thought, you know, he, he's, here's this thing, and he put out this challenge, like, design an initial configuration that iterates infinitely. Um, and given those rules, there's nothing that says that that should be possible or what that should look like. So through trial and error, uh, what's called the glider was invented. And the glider is a particular shape that moves through iterations in such a way, Conway's Game of Life runs that algorithm over the universe over and over and over again. And it moves in such a way that it moves through space and never, and it repeats infinitely. So from a finite initial state and a finite set of almost trivial rules, you can get infinite behavior. And the is, what is the connection between the initial state and the rules and the kind of behavior that you get? 
Um, and the answer is that there isn't one, right? You can't predict what it'll do without actually running through every single step. And Conway's game of life in that way is strongly emergent. And, and when I learned how that algorithm worked um, in college, it, for me, was a reflection on the universe that we live in. Given some initial configuration and given a set of you know, four basic rules, the rules of physics, um, you know, electromagnetism, uh, gravitational uh, gravity, uh, the strong and weak electric nuclear forces. Um, given a simple set of rules and initial configuration, you have this impossibly complex universe. And um, Conway's Game of Life was sort of a reflection on that incredible, incredibly elegant structure, right? And like how you can get profound complexity, not by starting with complexity and just getting more complexity, but by starting with something that can be described in a paragraph and just emerging from that. Um, that um, Wolfram published A New Kind of Science, which was uh, a really deep reflection on cellular automata as a way to understand the world and as a way to understand mathematics and science and to model you know, the world around us. Um, so that in this system, how do I design something that is, um, that can be, you know, described in a sentence, that can be understood at a glance, but at the same time is not limiting in its simplicity. So to give you an example, um, C++ as a programming language is not simple. It is, um, I think the, the rules for calling a function, um, on an instance in the spec are, you know, three or four pages long. Because of it, right, uh, C++, for all of its issues, is what Clouds is built in. Uh, it's what, there's actually an adorable uh, page on Strewstrip's personal website, where it's just like, oh, this is my personal site. And it's like, uh, there's a link to like projects and you click on it. One of those projects is C++ and you click on it. And there's a list of like things made in C++ because it's just this thing I made. And the list is like Windows, everything Adobe has ever made, most of Mac OS. And it's like, oh, wow, you, okay, you architected the modern world. So um, the, if, you, if you're just coding in an average fashion, you will tend towards unmaintainable and broken code. You really have to go out of your way to write um, maintainable, readable, sustainable code. Um, is C++ is almost like a trapeze artist that's blindfolded. The trapeze artist memorizes the, the routine and where everything is perfectly, and then just puts on a blindfold and then just jumps. And everything has to be exactly where it was, otherwise the trapeze artist will fall and die. A more dynamic language like JavaScript or Ruby are like trapeze artists with their eye, with the blindfold off, where you're kind of watching before you do everything and you have to check so when you send an object uh, a message in Ruby, it will actually check, does this message actually exist? And if it does exist, it'll run it. If it doesn't exist, then it'll, you know, it has other things that'll follow. Whereas in C++, if, if it doesn't exist, it just crashes. You know, it is. You know, it's like literally jumping in and out of memory, just calling things, writing to things. Everything has to be laid out correctly. Otherwise, you know, this is the program crashes. That's what a segmentation fault is, for example. Um, Which is interesting. Game, game development is, in a lot of ways, one of the most challenging things I think you can do in writing code. Um, um, Java was originally built to design to program set-top boxes. Um, C++ was originally designed for system tools. C was originally designed for Unix. It was like a one-off that we now you know, land airplanes with. Um, so I'm, I'm really, I'm aware of, so like you know, any, any author of a software system brings biases to the system that they built, and I'm aware of my own biases, and games is one of them.